Did you know that Catholic homeschoolers are producing a remarkable harvest of religious vocations? Today's guest is the mother of a cloistered sister. Anna Braga Hennebry is here to share some wonderful insights on how to foster religious vocations in your homeschool. Welcome to Homeschooling Saints, the podcast that helps you create the homeschool you love for the people you love. Our host is Lisa Maladnik, a Catholic life coach, TV host, best-selling author, and an instructor at Homeschool Connections. Hello and welcome. I'm Lisa Maladnik, and today we're talking with Anna Braga Hennebry about how to foster religious vocations in your homeschool. Anna Braga Hennebry is from Rio de Janeiro, where she grew up the seventh of a noisy, large Catholic family. Sounds familiar. She met her husband, Jeff, a university professor and international scientist, during graduate school in Texas. Anna homeschooled her seven children, who are now grown, the youngest being a rising sophomore at the University of Dallas. Anna has written for Homeschool and other periodicals for over 15 years. She is a reviewer and a contributor for Well-Read Mom and the Catholic Textbook Project, among others. She was on the editorial board as a writer for the Mater et Magistra Catholic Homeschool Periodical for the entirety of its duration. After a homeschool career of teaching at home and leading and teaching co-ops, having children accepted at Notre Dame directly from homeschool, among other colleges, she now teaches Latin at two parochial schools. Anna accepts speaking engagements if she can travel there by train. You can find Anna at her blog, which is Anna Braga Hennebry's journal, and that link is in the show notes. That's a blog spot blog, and we'll have that link for you, so don't worry if you're scrambling to write it all down. Welcome to the program, Anna. Thank you so much for having me, Lisa. What a delight to be here. Oh, yeah. I'm just so excited about this topic because I don't know if we really realize, those of us who are just starting to homeschool or have been homeschooling for a long time, just how much fruit God is drawing out of the homeschool movement. Our kids are more likely to attend Catholic events, including discernment events and youth ministry groups, and to have real conversations and support within the family for religious vocation discernment. And so a lot of us may wonder, wow, in those families that are producing these beautiful, passionate religious vocations, what are they doing in those homes? <laughs> we want to know. <laughs> so, so I guess just start with what, how do you kind of set the tone in your home, Anna? What's the beginning? I'm delighted to speak about that. And actually, when you um, spoke the introduction, it reminded me, I always thought that the number of vocations coming out of Catholic homeschool was high. But, you know, I have my little sister, the 10 of 10, is a religious Benedictine in Germany. And when I was visiting with her the last time I was there, Mother Superior told me, made the remark about the number of young vocations in the United States. And uh, of course, we all know that is not the case in Europe. And so Mother Superior told me, well, but you know, in the United States, you have the homeschooling movement, you have Catholic homeschooling. And I, I never heard that so directly, especially from, you know, a Mother Superior of a, of a religious community. And, uh, and yes, for sure, it's, uh, it's something we're all very grateful for, the Catholic home. Of course, not all vocations come from Catholic homeschool, but I think that Catholic homeschooling is definitely so well suited for fostering and cultivating a religious vocation. And since my daughter has entered, um, that has been a subject that has, people have approached me about it several times. So I would say the first thing and how do we set the tone, it's probably what most Catholic homeschoolers already do every day is uh, to have your life at home centered on the faith. So when you live the faith at home, that will reflect in everything you do, especially in your prayer life. Of course, we go to Mass where most of us are active in our parishes, but I would say both the personal life of the parents inviting God to guide and to be present in their lady life. When we ask God, even through our sinfulness, we know he answers. So we ask him every day to guide and he will come to our aid. 
And also the family prayer time, I would say, Lisa, are crucial things. Um, no matter what happens, we have family prayer time at bedtime and raising the kids with that expectation, with that, just knowing that that's how a Christian, a Catholic closes the day by bringing things to God, by giving glory to God, by asking and just putting our whole lives in, in his loving hands. And of course, our, our friends, the saints and our Blessed Mother as well. Yeah, it's just such a beautiful image of having the humility to recognize that in our brokenness and in, in our incomplete understanding of God's love for us, that God still works powerfully through that. Yes, amen. He does. And we've seen it. And we see it in the families that we know, our friends, and in our own family. Thanks be to God. So as far as preparing your children, like obviously you've set a tone of bringing everything before the Lord, of centering your life and ending the day in that beautiful Catholic way of family prayer. What else do you do to prepare your children's hearts and minds to even consider a life dedicated in wholehearted service to the Lord? I would say that a very important thing is especially for me, I've always been a, a book person, is um, the kind of books we read at home, the choice of books, the choice of, of homeschool curriculum, which is a fun thing to do, always picking and um, choosing what we think is, you know, the most inspiring things and the best quality and the best uh, that things that reflect virtue in the movies we choose to watch with them, but especially in the books and especially uh, reading aloud or having the kids read on their own, the lives of the saints. I would say that has, I, I've always thought that reading the lives of the saints is such a, just an incredible addition to the homeschool curriculum. And I wish every Catholic school would do that as well, because we learn not only about how they inspire us by their virtue and their love of God, but we also can tie in with geography and history and so much more. You know, they're just so enriching to, to, um, to our homeschool curriculum to learn, you know, all the times and places and history they come from. But, but I do think that having saints in all of their humility and holiness be wonderful guides for our children through you know the, the daily lessons every day is a wonderful thing for that you know if there is a religious vocation to be growing in the home what a wonderful way for them to enjoy these stories and be inspired by them yeah two things come to mind in any conversation about our children learning about the lives of the saints. One is that it shows them the incredible variety of lives and gifts and kinds of service and personalities that can draw of, you know, that where God can draw that line from that human heart directly to his heart, that that can look really different from human being to human being. And I also love the other aspect that certain saints may ignite a child's interest in particular and then become a lifelong friend. Yes, I have seen that. And it's, especially during confirmation time, they have so many saints they have gotten to know through these good books and our conversations in the homeschool to choose from. And what a wonderful problem to have. Lots of friends in heaven, lots of holy friends in heaven. <laughs> yeah, that cloud of witnesses. It's so thrilling to think of our children seeing themselves as part of that extended family. I think that the the prayer and the the... You know, just making sure that in everything we do in life, um, especially when it comes to kids' entertainment and music and movies and books, that, you know, as parents, we really should always be watching. Not, not just saying no to things they may encounter, but really presenting them with excellent things. Just looking for what are the higher choices out there? What are some, you know how many times we go online and ask other moms, other homeschool moms, what are some of the old movies your kids have enjoyed? And there's so much out there that we can find. Just making sure that in our home, they are immersed in what is the best we can find to, to raise them with. What kinds of family stories or traditions help you ignite curiosity or or a sense of the mystery of our relationship with God? In other words, 
answered prayers, family stories of faith? Or, or is there any kind of a, a tradition there around like great conversations? You know, I'm glad you asked that because one thing that we've always been careful for is to have dinners around the table. I've actually done some cooking classes and, and I, I can have a cooking class to a completely secular environment, but I will say things like, you know, treat your table around the dinner, your guests and your family as a sacred thing. Set the table with a tablecloth, light candles. You know, I remember my mother would always say, every dinner is a reflection of the Last Supper. So, so like teaching the children to set the table and to sit around the table respectfully to say a prayer before meal, it seems so commonplace. But I think with things like that, we're really building them you know, this, this civilization of this Christian civilization in their heart, that there's a way to live that gives glory to God and that can reflect God's love for us, you know, in everything we do. But um, with family prayer too, you know, we'd always invite the kids to say their intentions. And it was, it's always um, interesting to me how by them bringing up the intentions of who or what they want to pray for, um, the conversation. I mean, sometimes we'd be 40 minutes just during, just listening to a child saying, I want to pray for so-and-so because, and things would come up. So that would, uh, so that pre-prayer time, really, I think everybody looked forward to that. And, uh, and of course, with my husband and I leading um, and showing them that we pray for, you know, we don't turn this into gossip. We pray for people because we want the best for them. We want for them to be holy and, and to be healed or whatever we're praying for. So those have, uh, I think, just, just that prayer time at home and just opening up the kids to bring up what's in their hearts and their minds at bedtime. Um, it is very helpful. And when they they bring their friends over, we would do that. And their friends were really looking forward to being in our home, let's say, for a sleepover or evening and participating in prayer time with us. So there was something really good that they loved about it. Yes. Yeah, and I love the image, too, of the tablecloth and the candles, and you connected it with the Last Supper. It certainly reminds me of the way we prepare the altar. And as you said, that sacredness of breaking bread together, that kind of incarnational sense of being fed and nurtured. And, and I know that some Catholic families, as they light candles, will recall that Christ is present and that, the, that he's the light of the world. And they may say something, they may not, but that's part of that ritual from them for them. And also that gathering together as a community of prayer. What, I mean, those two images, like the, the altar slash kind of family table and that sense of the community of prayer and its impact. What have your children noticed about the impact of prayer? Have they ever related anything back to you in regards to that? You know, that's a good question. Um, we have, as a family, said some novenas. You know, we've moved a lot because of my husband's work. And there was definitely one time that everybody remembers that we had been looking for a house. You know, and it's not easy. You know how it is to find a house that um, can accommodate all this large family that does not need a million-dollar home. And <laughs> so we were saying this beautiful novena to St. Joseph the Worker, if I remember well. And of course, we were sitting down on the ninth day of the novena when the realtor calls with a, something that was about to go on the market that turned out to be a home that we all have loved for years. So, you know, that we do remember these things when the kids get together. You know, they do remember the prayers. Some prayer, we know every prayer is answered, but some of them are so clearly and immediately answered that sticks in their minds and and uh, and stay you know with them and now with some of my adult kids you know we do novenas together from a distance we just pick the same prayer and 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 you know and do it and and definitely i mean our whole lifetime is a lifetime of prayers answered thanks be to god so there are many of those stories yes yeah so what other ways do you incorporate that practicing the faith bringing it to life for your kids I think one thing that's important, and, and, and I'm sorry to say that's not the case for everyone, is um, especially little girls, they don't see religious sisters very often anymore. I know we always see at least a diocesan priest, but we also don't see, let's say, a bunch of seminarians together. So to look for opportunities that maybe um, your diocese has like an adopt a seminarian program. Some dioceses have that. Um, so you can invite a seminarian over sometimes and pray for them every day. 
or religious sisters in a convent nearby that you can maybe plan a visit. You know, that's a wonderful thing for homeschool families to do together, to go visit a convent or bring uh, some groceries or some convents open for girls to come for like a day of work. Um, so look for opportunities like that. If you, if you really live far away from all that, maybe in a family trip, we've done that. You can stop at a certain convent. Let's say like I had Benedictine sisters growing up in my school. So I love the Benedictines for that reason. And um, there was one time we almost kind of accidentally bumped into this Benedictine abbey. And you know, we had the courage to get out of the car, knock on the door and say hello. And we've uh -huh. become lifelong friends with them. So just exposing your children in, in whatever way you can, just making that effort. So they see beautiful, joyful, religious vocations being lived in the world today and experience that. I think that's very important so that they have, you know, they, they know what it looks like. <laughs> Yes, and you're so joyful, Anna. Uh, do you ever just, you or your husband, talk about how you discerned your own vocation to marriage with the children? Yes. I was in the point of my life in graduate school. I had just started where um, I really brought that to God, and I really wanted to know what he wanted of me. And so I had this very heartfelt prayer one day, and, and, and later on, and I actually, I actually told him, I give you a year for you to tell me what's going to happen in my life. And and looking back a little later, it was to that day I was married to Jeff. So oh it was goodness. a very quick graduate school, getting to know each other and courtship. And so, and all the kids know that, that our major decisions in life, we need to bring them up to God. Jeff wasn't a Catholic then. He became, he joined our CIA and became a Catholic after that. So that was, you know, another wonderful blessing. I didn't know that at the point. I just knew he was a wonderful man who was, you know, interested in the fact that I had been a very religious person and throughout my life. And so God was just good and provided that for us. But yes, yeah, so just that that your life um, is a prayer and that God answers prayers is certainly a theme <laughs> over here. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, that's so lovely. And in the course of raising your children, what have you noticed about them? Um, maybe start with your daughter, who is the cloistered nun. Was, were there early signs of her vocation? You know, there were. There were. And I can't say that at early on when she was six years old that I would say, I'm sure she has a vocation. But in the mother's heart in there, I knew that she just had this love for God that was, and this, this attraction for the holier things. You know, she, she just, you know, when, when you have your, your daughter at home all the time, you just know her so well. And that's one of the beauties of homeschooling, right? You just, um, you know, your children so well because you're always with them. And so I knew early on from her first Holy Communion, which was at six years old. And, and from there that, she just had this this seriousness about holy things, this desire to know more, this uh, this need for prayer. She would be the one who would, you know, go more often with me, let's say to daily mass or or go to the altar of the Blessed Mother after mass and, and say an extra prayer. And she would have beautiful prayer books that she would bring to mass. And, and you know, so, so there, in many little things I knew uh, that maybe she would be married, but she would always be a prayerful person. Um, so it was, you know, we, I was, so it wasn't a surprise when she started um, going to convent visits. Our diocese had something called a nun run, and some dioceses have that, and where a director of vocations uh, with maybe a couple of uh, young women will take a few girls to visit some convents. What a wonderful program. And so from that visit, she chose two of those convents to go back on retreats. This is still during high school. Um, so if your diocese doesn't have that, maybe other families want to get together and just take the girls to go visit some. Um, but the fact that she was interested in that, that she saw a note in the bulletin and said, oh, mom, look, that looks nice. So, yes, a mother knows. Um, of course, some vocations aren't like that. We all know that. I know of a young sister who is just becoming a novice soon, and I don't think she's ever in her life thought of a religious vocation. She just had this, you know, um, 
very Pauline type of conversion or or enlightenment that you know one day she just knew she had to go to a convent and her whole life was turned upside down. But I think more often than not, maybe the way I saw my daughter's vocation growing would be a little more um, more normal, more common than those those lightning fast overnight. You know, I know God calls us in every, every different way. But I think that a mother, a loving mother in a prayerful home, seeing what I saw um, would, would do the same thing. Make sure that child is, is you know, um, she has good materials, good prayer books, um, good friends, good environment, um, and that she needs more prayer time that that is given to her. And, and you know, just, just helping foster her desire and attraction for the higher things and the things of God. When we have that inkling that we may be seeing a religious vocation, you said providing books and things like that, making sure that they have what they need to develop a prayer life. What are some other things that, that you noticed that she needed uh, in particular, like ways to really support her or help draw that vocation clarity out in her? So, you know, I, I offered early on, you know, that I would drive if she wanted her own adoration hour. And she said, yes, I do. But she wasn't, she didn't drive yet. So making sure that either my husband or I would always drive her to that and not, you know, just commit to those things. Of course, the homeschooling, some of our daughters or kids went to high school, um, Catholic or public, because of the different circumstances. And and just telling her, if you know, um, making sure her high school years were excellent with whatever she needed because she didn't want to go to school. She had good friends and, and really she wanted, her curriculum was, was very challenging. She was just, oh, she challenged herself. She had a lot of the classics she read in high school. She did some homeschool connection, online classes and some other ones. So uh, making sure she had the time to study that she was very shy. She still is. Um, and so just finding some job or volunteer opportunities that would she would be comfortable with, but at the same time, not just having her sit at home all day. So through knowing some people in a nursing home, I volunteered, she would come and play piano for them once a week. Nice. So things like that. Yes. Uh, the couple of nursing homes she went and sang too. She sang for them and played piano. And, and so that got her out in the world a little bit doing some some of God's work without you know having to have her work in a in a grocery store where she would not be so comfortable doing that so just you know a mother can be very creative right Lisa we just kind of find ways and God help us to find things for our kids to do that will be they'll be comfortable with and that will all be you know helping them develop who they are in peace, you know? Yes. I mean, you clearly have a gift. I mean, we all do see our children more clearly than others do, generally speaking. But I think you also have a gift for seeing that individual child and seeing her needs and being able to pour into them in a way that challenges her. And yet it allows her to still authentically be herself. You're not making her wrong for being, a sh being shy or being an introvert. You are working with it in a way that still helps her to stretch and grow. Yeah, all your kids, I'm sure, have different personalities and temperaments. So give us some other thoughts on how to encourage at least that discernment process, not necessarily for religious life, but that like developing that spirituality that's going to provide that strong foundation. Yeah, you know, it, it, you're right about all of our kids being so different and her being such an introvert and I've been such an extrovert. I had to learn a lot about how to deal with, you know, what is it? What, how do introverts think and see the world, you know, to, to be able to be a good mother for her? You know, because we extroverts think everybody can be like us. But no, I had to learn with my daughter that that was not the case. And she was never going to be like me. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I think uh, reading materials, um, choosing a parish or a mass with good sermons, good priests, good examples of people who live their faith. Choosing, for instance, a um, like, let's say, a confirmation sponsor. You know how much we talked about that. You know, someone who can be a prayerful person, who always be a stable example and loving. 
you know, talking about putting her in contact with other religious. I, I mentioned my little sister is a Benedictine professed sister in Germany. So she and my sister started a correspondence, you know, reading different spiritual readings and and to this day, you know, they write to each other's convent now. So, oh, how lovely. Yes. You know, there's so much. There's so much goodness there. I mean, in, in middle school, we did a literature program that had a lot of saints books. One of them was St. Athanasius, which I, I didn't know anything about St. Athanasius. We read that book aloud, and we just loved it. And, you know, last time I saw our daughter, she said, you know, I'm thinking Athanasius might be one of my names in my list from Mother Superior because I never forgot reading that book. Wow. You know, he was such an amazing saint that we don't usually think of St. Athanasius on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. she was also a very good student of Latin. So at some point she asked if she could have a Bible in Latin. So just, you know, that wasn't you know, a, a common purchase you usually do, but looking for that, finding a beautiful one, wrapping up as a birthday gift, you know, just, just things like that. I remember, you know, if you go to a Catholic gift shop, taking her with you and saying, you know, what are, what are some of the things here you'd like to have, you know, as a, you know, early Christmas gift. I and mean, we find the opportunities, right? So, so, you know, just uh, making sure that, She's comfortable to ask us, does she need another book? Does she want, is she interested in something else? Would she like to talk to someone? And then, you know, that her sacraments, you know, she wants to go to confession or talk to someone that you arrange that for them. Um, you know, with her being so shy, I had to sometimes pry a little, you know, would you like to stay later at church today? You know, would you like to go to, you know, the cathedral for the Holy Thursday Mass? And I knew she loved the Holy Thursday Mass. She still does. And, and she would say, yeah, what, can we do that, mom? You know, and so just that making sure you, you provide, you know, you're, we're busy mother of several kids. It's easy to say, forget it. I don't have time for this, you know. So just putting that as a very important thing, a priority in making time. Yeah, so setting a, a tone, practicing the faith together, and preparing their faith by always sharing those beautiful saint stories and educating your children in the faith. And I love what you said, uh, just to reflect back on when you're studying the lives of the saints, integrating it into your history and geography and all of that, like really bringing it to life for them. Because we can misunderstand plaster saint images as being that they were these stiff, holier-than-thou people that that didn't have adventures and didn't make mistakes. But when we really learn about their lives and start to put them in context of a period of history or the things that they did or their early life and mistakes they may have made, I think that gives our children a sense that that could be me. Exactly, that they were people like us, that, that, they, that we all have the calling to be saints and they weren't born any differently than we were. Um, and that by by learn, by reading from early on their lives to the kids i think it it makes them realize that it is attainable that we can all strive for virtue and for holiness and you know they they are on altars and we do and pray to the saints but there's we need to see them as human beings that are very interested in helping us as well <laughs> so they are really our great friends so we can go to them when you know, when we have one that, you know, her little sister, my youngest one, loves animals. And so St. Martin de Porres and his ability to, you know, that she just, she was always enchanted by him because he was so kind to the little animals, to the lowest animals. And, and sure enough, when it came to her confirmation time, she said, I want St. Martin de Porres to be my confirmation wow. saint because they were bound together by this love for animals that she read in a book when she was very young. That's just beautiful. That's right, yes. Yeah. Anna, take us out with uh, some final thoughts on, you know, just speaking to any parents out there wondering if they can do this. I would love to. You know, when she first told us about her decision, it did make us cry a lot. It was a very defining moment for us. And then I had a religious sister who told us because I was crying and telling her about it. And she said, it is a great sacrifice for parents, but also 
uh, her sacrifice will bless your family immensely. And those words consoled my heart more than anything I can. She just, that sister, God bless her. She knew exactly her Holy Spirit helped her. And I have seen it now with our daughter in her cloistered community in how many ways her presence there and her choice for life has blessed us. And we just we just have this overwhelming feeling of gratitude that God had has given us this privilege of having her grow up um, in our home. We're just extremely grateful through all of our misgivings and faults that we were able to raise her to find her vocation and be so joyful where she is. What a touching image to carry in our hearts as we wrap up for today. Anna Braga Hennebry, thank you so much. Everyone find her at her blog, which is in our show notes, the Anna Braga Hennebry Journal dot mm-hmm. blogspot dot com. And again, the link is in the show page. Anna, thank you again. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's been a joy to be here and talk to you. Thank you. All right, everybody, stay tuned for our short feature coming right up. Welcome everyone, my name is Chantal Howard, and this is From Ideal to Real, where I enjoy making lofty and holy pipe dreams more accessible and attainable for Catholic moms everywhere. So my daughter is a senior this year, and I've been reflecting on the journey of getting her to this point. It's been a bit of a rough road, (laughs) but we have come to a place of peace. I'm at peace with the formation I've been able to offer her, and she is at peace with the opportunities she's been given to prepare her for adulthood. If I had to summarize it, though, I would do so by saying it's been a process of letting the wheat and the weeds grow together. I've learned over the course of 12 years of homeschooling her that I can't expect to be able to pick out all of the negative influences turn off all the technology, or shelter her from all the evil fashions and trends that flaunt their way into the minds and hearts of our young people. In fact, the wisdom of scripture has proved itself time and again that when we try to uproot all the weeds, the wheat can be destroyed in the process. By holding on too tight, we can strangle our children's gifts, their capacity to be victorious, and we can even choke their love of the faith. So what's the solution? Do we not protect our kids, set down boundaries around technology, and prevent our children from worldly interactions that could corrupt their innocence? I want to share with you three tips that may help you as you discern your own approach to managing the dilemma of the wheat and the weeds in your homeschool. In particular, I imagine these helpful concerning decisions around technology, friends, and functions. Number one, Remember, the answer doesn't always have to be no. We're so quick to want to control our children and often disguise our obsession with perfection under a holy battle cry. Pause before you respond and truly seek to see if there is any way you can prudently, safely, and peacefully say yes. Some perceived evils are really just opportunities to help form self-control and the virtue of prudence in our children. Number two, like God revealed in his own parenting of us as his people, I encourage you to seek to discover when the time is right to move from a thou shalt not parenting model to a blessed are you when parenting model. Most tweens and teens respond best with ample affirmation, and by doing so, we can raise the bar of our expectations and truly nurture a culture of mercy in our homes. Number three, whenever possible, surprise your kids by leveraging for joy, merriment, and positive lessons the very things that they think you abhor. For example, Movies, music, fashion, social media, YouTube, dances, shopping, travel, trendy friend groups, parties, and even dating can all be powerful tools if we stretch ourselves to see through the lens of wisdom. After all, we've been called to be cunning as serpents and gentle as doves. 
In doing so, we will form memories that will attract our children back to principles and virtuous living long after they've left our nests. Like good literature, the lesson often comes through the contrast of good and evil. We must accept that not everything is as black and white as we would like, and that we must learn to gracefully tolerate the world, especially if we wish to convert the hearts and win the souls of our children. I'm Chantal Howard, author, essential oil advocate, leadership coach, rosary lover, and homeschooling mama. You can find me at chantal-howard.com or aromarosary.com. That's our show for today. Our program is sponsored by homeschoolconnections.com, where you can get online courses for your grade school, middle school, and high school student. Learn from the experts and make your homeschooling easier. Be sure to leave a review and share this podcast with your friends. And we'll see you next time here on the Homeschooling Saints podcast.